Okay, <clears throat> so just a couple things about the Enlightenment before we move on from it that I wanted to touch on that didn't have a chance to in our last class. Um, and that is that horrible, for some of you might have been, although I just said skim the, the very first stanzas, just get a feel of it. But that long poem, Essay of Man, written by uh, Alexander Pope. Now, again, I hope you just did what I suggested and get a feel for it and just skim like the first couple stanzas. What you have there is a classic piece of poetry from the Enlightenment. All poetry was like that in the 16 and 1700s. Long, somewhat epic, didactic, meaning teaching poetry, philosophical, logical. All the poems were written heroic couplets, like that poem, which means it was all an iambic pentameter with rhyming couplets, so 10 syllables per line. Each line rhymes with the next one. So it forms couplets, which creates these sort of enumerated moments of thought. So a very rationalistic, dry poetry that was written during the Enlightenment. Although, I mean, it's not to our taste at all anymore. Most people don't go around reading, you know, 17th and 18th century poetry because, well, it's so dry and boring and it doesn't, it's not what we recognize as poetry today. And we'll see the big difference that happens with Romanticism, <laughs> which takes poetry into the expressive and the emotional and the lyrical and having to do with feelings. The poetry of the Enlightenment has nothing to do with feelings. It all has to do with reason. It's very Vulcan, like Mr. Spock kind of poetry. And the great poets of that period, Alexander Pope, who essay a man is by him, or John Dryden or Jonathan Swift or Rochester, all these figures, they did not see poetry at all, it would have been foreign to them. The idea of poetry being a way of expressing feelings or communicating something on the level of personal confessional stuff to a reader. For poets of that period, they felt that they were the mouthpieces for a civilization and that their job was to sort of teach, you know, the ideas of the enlightenment and of civilization, kind of like taking like what Thomas Jefferson and John Locke and all those guys were doing in philosophy and putting it into verse. But the reason why I asked you to glance at Alexander Pope's poem is one, just to get a feel for how sort of dry and stuffy the poetry is and how when we get to romanticism, it's like a huge liberation from that. But also because in that poem, and it's worth reading if you're into the history, intellectual history, <clears throat> what Pope's doing in this long poem, really, is he's giving a kind of blueprint for the capacity of reason to know what it can know in the world, but also as a kind of warning, kind of a satire, actually, and I'll get to satire in a minute, of pride, of trying to think you can go beyond the limitations of what you can know. So the whole poem really is about how we can use our minds to make sense of things within our comprehensible sphere without going beyond what our minds can conceive of and how much one can do if one stays within the limitations of what we can know rather than trying like they did in the middle ages going off into the transcendent and going into realms of things that we can't know whatsoever so really, Essay and Man, if you want to boil it down, it's Pope warning that we don't want to return to the superstitions and the revelatory faith of the recent past, the medieval era, the Middle Ages, in which one thought we could figure out the heavens or to figure out God. For Pope, the whole thing is, no, you don't go there. You're never going to figure that out. The job of the of man, of human being, is to know what you can know, <laughs> to use your common sense and to focus on what's in front of you kind of idea. Um, the whole thing becomes kind of what you might call a blueprint for what at the time was known as deism. That's D-E-I-S-M. 
a capital D. And I used that word a lot in the last class without really defining it. I told you guys that all the signers of the Declaration of Independence were essentially deists. Deism isn't something that's around at all anymore. Nobody walks around saying they're a deist, but in the, but in the 16 and to the 1700s, it was a very powerful movement. A kind of religious movement, but not really. So deism is not like a church. You know, there wasn't like a deist church or like a deist Bible. Deism was a way of thinking shared by the intellectuals of the Enlightenment. And what deism is, is it played into the reigning philosophy of, of the time of people like Spinoza and Leibniz and Kant and others who were establishing the parameters of reason, what we can rationalize. And what deism purported was a way of seeing the world as a clean break from the sort of superstitious hierarchical Middle Ages of the past. So what deism says, and I'll put it in a nutshell, they argued that yes, there is a God and God created the world. And for Thomas Jefferson, that's the creator he refers to in the declaration and that we're endowed by the creator. And notice, and I'll put it this way, notice in the declaration, God has a place. He's the creator who endowed us with reason who endowed us with rights and freedom to think for ourselves. And from that point on, the Declaration notice that God doesn't figure anymore. It's all what we can do. That's deism. Deism says there's a God who created the universe and essentially recedes. And that, the, that God doesn't do anything else. He, he, the universe works without God's intervention kind of thing. A way you could think of it is, God, the way the deists would see it is that God is all perfect being, right? Perfect, all loving, all benevolent, and completely perfect. And the logic goes, therefore, the universe God creates is also perfect. Therefore, if one wants to understand God, one doesn't try to go to God. One tries to understand how the universe works, what we can observe in front of us. Because God's universe is going to exhibit the perfection of God himself. Is this making sense? So if God is perfect, creates a perfect universe, instead of trying to figure out God, let's figure out what we can figure out. The laws of the universe itself. You know, nature and things like that around us. Which is why, like I brought up Newton a couple of classes ago in physics, that's where physics evolves from, are people who begin to stop looking for revelation or to the Bible, but are beginning to look at things like motion, you know, in the world, are beginning to look at, you know, the physical properties of the world itself to figure out the laws, you know, of the universe. And it's because of deism, you can see a clear distinction now between you know the way that you know god was perceived through bible and revelation in the past to deism which sees god as being kind of what they call the watchmaker <laughs> who recedes in the background and the thing that he creates the watch sort of works perfectly without god or the watchmaker um therefore no longer do we have to sort of wait for like some supernatural revelation or consult the Bible or to get, you know, some kind of sign or wonder. The idea is we're endowed, as Jefferson would say, or Pope, we're endowed with the gift of reason to understand what we can. And as long as we can check our pride and recognize that we can only understand that which our reason can give us to understand, that there's parameters to what we can know, we'll be in good shape. For people like Pope and other deists, what happens is if you go outside of what you are your limitations of reason and think you can know more, that's when a fall can happen. That's when things spiral out of control. And for deists and enlightenment thinkers in the 1700s, they were very afraid that there would be people that would bring us back to some kind of period where we had the pride to believe we can get to know God or you know we can begin to go beyond what we can know. This plays even into the establishment of our government in America. 
the whole checks and balances system and the different branches of government all was designed as a way to check the kind of exuberance of human pride to overreach. You can't have a leader overreaching because there's a legislative or judicial branch to check the executive branch. You can't have a judicial branch going too far in things because then you can have, you know, the executive branch or the legislative branch to create laws that check the things that the judicial branch did. The whole idea is to rein everything into a moderation, to rein everything into checking and balancing our own, you know, propensity to think beyond our abilities kind of idea, which is also one of the reasons why, in some ways, our country, when it comes to revolutionary things, moves at a bit of a snail's pace, right? Everything is done with these careful checks and balances on things. But anyhow, deism is the kind of thing at the center of that modern way of thinking that balances a belief in God and balances a belief in our freedom of thinking and the kind of parameters of common sense, learning what we can know, what's in front of us, as opposed to going off into the ether of the transcendent and trying to figure out things we'll never figure out kind of idea. Here's the deal. <clears throat> you can see that it's an easy step to the most consummate of secularism from deism atheism because eventually and it's, it happens pretty quickly in the 1700s a lot of these thinkers like benjamin franklin and stuff begin to realize what do we need god for you know, you know god yeah god maybe there is a god created but who cares you know that's receded over there why don't we just deal with what we have in front of us without the you know the burden of a god in a sense and in fact like i suggested you guys the early to mid 1700s was probably one of the most secular periods in the United States, certainly at least. And it's one of the things that led to something we're not going to look at, but you're, it's a very interesting issue. It's one of the things that led in the mid to late 1700s and definitely the early 1800s, what is known as the Great Awakening. <laughs> Religious groups, mostly Protestant, who came to see that secularism was essentially killing off church and faith and, it was. and you started getting figures like Jonathan Edwards and then other figures like the Methodist Church and then different wings of Protestantism who brought in the brimstone and thunder sort of sermons and the revival movements that re-sparked a religious fervor in the country and guys it never went away it's those great awakening movements that then led into things like the evangelical movement, the fundamentalist movement that are very powerful today, the Pentecostal movements, the charismatic movements. You know, we're still in a great awakening essentially as a kind of, as essentially a rebellion against the enlightenment, you know, secularist empiricism of the 1700s. So it's kind of an interesting issue with that. But anyhow, that's what I wanted to touch on in this short lecture. When, and what I wanted to talk about in class today was the deist mindset that does allow for clear common sense thinking and keeping God kind of bracketed off. Um, oh, one thing I'll say is it leads into what is known in philosophy as sufficient cause. What sufficient cause means is that, okay, there is a divine being, a God, who creates a perfect universe. Therefore, God is the sufficient cause. We don't need to explore God anymore. We need to explore the cause, essentially what God created. And that's sufficient enough. And you get that in Alexander Pope's poem in the last line of the first epistle, where Pope claims, one truth is clear. Whatever is, is right. Nothing encapsulates deism and sufficient cause more than that. Don't question <laughs> if something doesn't seem right over here or if the parts of the whole are kind of out of joint over there. Don't have pride thinking you'll get to see the whole big thing. Accept the fact that God created it, therefore it must be perfect. And it, we just can't see the full picture kind of idea. Um, anyhow, so, and again, 
this is that deist movement is the thing that eventually becomes the sort of consummate secularism that, well, for the most part, breeds agnosticism, atheism, kind of the culture we're in right now, which we'll talk about in our next class, certainly, how we are a kind of culture that is religious. We, we haven't lost religion. But we think of religious, like I, religion, like I said in the last class, as something as a product of the Enlightenment, a private affair. You know, religion is something that is not in the public sphere anymore. It's not part of politics. It's not just making the decisions on the way we live and run life or run a government. It's a private thing that we engage in freely. Um, but that doesn't mean we're not religious. We are right now in our culture, kind of curious blend of secular sacred. We're kind of religious, not religious, or a blend of, mostly most of us, I'll put it this way, and I bet all of you would agree to some extent, most of us kind of adhere to a religion or a spirituality that we define as being good for us, which is a very different thing than it was 200 years ago or further back, where <laughs> no, the institution of religion defined what religion was for you. Today, it's the other way around. You know, like I'm a Catholic, you know, and, you know, I've never given up my Catholicism. I'm not a huge church goer anymore. So I'm what they call backsliding Catholic, you know, and I still adhere to some Catholicism, but I'm a buffet style Catholic. I take what I like and I reject all that other stuff I don't like, like anti-abortion, anti-women stuff. But I take the things I do like. That's kind of what we are, you know, religiously, I would suggest. And a lot of that is a result of certainly the Enlightenment and deism and things of that sort. All right, guys. So the next lecture I'll either make tonight or maybe sometime tomorrow morning, we'll move into the next cultural movement, romanticism.